the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame presentation of the Hall of Fame Weekend is brought to you by Bell Hospital, Peninsula Bank, A. Lindbergh & Sons, The Country Village, The United States Olympic Committee, Holly Forest Products, The Mining Journal, Fox UP, 100.3 The Point. The generosity of all the sponsors makes this presentation possible. As we come off the best racing season in the record of American winter sports, let's take a moment to reflect on the generation of American racers, on years of determination and hard work, and on incredible individual achievements that have come before this season. Because after all, it's upon this past that the current success has been built. And the U.S. National Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame is the Pantheon honoring and holding in trust our legacy of snow sport so we can look to the future with the strength of our past. Amid generations of Scandinavians, the museum resides in the crucible of American Nordic skiing, Ishpeming, at the tip of Michigan's Upper Peninsula. The best of the hall's film collection of over 700 titles is currently being digitized under a federal grant making its incredible visual record accessible for future generations. This collection features over 300 John Jay films, which, like the title of his 1949 film, stretches from Alps to Andes, offering a parade of skiing's who's who, with visual treasures from the 1930s through the 1970s. It features six Olympics, and the birth, growth, and development of countless ski areas and towns. It can take us from Ketchum in the 30s to Steamboat in the 40s. And Jay was a cameraman with the 10th Mountain Division from their formation through World War II. We enjoy and can share this heritage because of the commitment of the U.S. Hall of Fame's work to recover and digitize their best films. Jim, this will be my last national ski race that I'll be racing in. Uh, How long have you been racing? Well, I started racing when I was five and a half years old. That was my first competition. The first medal that I won was when I was five and a half. Five and a half. Years. How many Olympic teams, buddy? Uh, just two Olympic teams. I broke my leg before I made the third one in uh, 1960. I remember that quite well. Yes. Buddy, we hate to see you bow out, but everybody does. Well, and you have left an imprint that nobody will forget. One month later, Buddy Werner was killed in a Swiss avalanche. Buddy Werner of Steamboat Springs, whose credo was, I never look back. If I crash this week, what the hell? There's another race coming up next week. There was only one place to finish, first. And that's where Buddy Werner finished. A pathfinder for those who follow. And like the films, the lives, stories, and records of the Hall of Fame's inductees offers a continuing tradition to inspire coming generations. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage President and CEO, Tom West. Good evening and welcome. And I hope you enjoyed seeing some of that old skiing footage. Brings back memories, I think, for many people. Anyway, good evening and welcome. And thank you for taking the time to be here tonight as we welcome the class of 2011 to Ishpeming and to complete their induction into the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame. Your support for our events this weekend and by being here is very important. We call this the class of 2011 because that is when these eight outstanding individuals were elected to the Hall of Fame. Because this takes place in the fall every year, we can only arrange their induction during the following year. We at the Hall of Fame are very proud of our selection process, 
which invites no nominations from everyone in the skiing and snowboarding community, with the final election taking place online with over 100 knowledgeable and passionate supporters of snow sports taking part. So visit our website if you're looking for more information on this. www.skihall.com And to learn more about the process, which is open and as transparent as possible to ensure fairness throughout. As you're about to discover, we have a great class of inductees this year. We have three Olympians, two great developers and managers of ski resorts, the man who pioneered the network of fall ski shows across the country, a legend in the writing of our, of our great sport, and another whose passion for skiing history and generosity will ensure its preservation for generations. Their stories will truly inspire you to give you an idea of the quality of the people who become honored members of the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame. I want you to think back to last year. How many of you remember the outstanding adaptive skier and Paralympic champion Muffy Davis, who is here? Muffy was ne is never content to rest on her record. She wasn't in London this month, where she competed in the women's hand cycling events at the Paralympics and won three gold medals. She is as amazing as the people you are about to meet tonight. So sit back for the next hour and enjoy the show. Please take a moment to check out our sponsors in the back of your program. Without their support, this Hall of Fame weekend would not be possible. We have some special guests here tonight as well. I believe Steve, Representative Steve Lindbergh is in the audience. I was told he was going to be here. Maybe couldn't make it at the last minute. But certainly Claudia Demarest from the uh, City Council of the City of Ishmael. She's here. Claudia, will you just stand and let people know? There she is. Okay. Thank you, Claudia. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the famous Frida Wara, our host for this evening. Frida. Oh, I love this night. This is family reunion on steroids. It's just so great to be glued together as a family connected by snow. And it's really a pleasure to be here again in Peterson Auditorium. And it's a night of storytelling. We can't ski today. Well, I did see some folks skiing, roller skiing. That's been going on for a couple of weeks now along the bike path. But tonight we can tell the stories of skiing and be inspired by them. You know, it's the time of year when the ski magazines are coming and everybody's starting to pick up their equipment. I know I had a little meeting with Brandon Crony just the other day to say exactly which skis I might be racing on this year. And I'm going to be with Jeannie Thorne. She's going to tweak my boots. And Ingrid Feldheim, I think, is going to get us all in shape so that the Nokamanon, which is probably now less than 100 days away or something crazy like that, get ready for it. But before we meet our inductees for this class, I just wanted to honor those of us in this room that are in this room, and I know Rudy Mackey's here, who have already earned that Medal of Honor. And if you could just please stand if you have earned the Medal of Honor from the Hall of Fame, our honored members that are here. Rudy's there. Come on, Rudy. Very special. Our hometown heroes here from this town of Ishpeming, there have been Paul Walt and Ralph Biedela, Bert Boyum, Junkman Joe, Paul Perot, and also Coy Hill. And I believe this is the first induction I've ever been to where Coy has not been here and he will truly be missed. But the stories begin because skiing is so amazing. Just watching that footage that Rick Moulton had put together what is it about skiing? It, it's, it's more than just racing. It is where it is that we do our sport and in that incredible snowy environment. And unlike other sports halls of fame, we don't just honor athletes. The Honored Medal also recognizes those remarkable people who dedicate their time and talent to taking a sport to the new level. And for those of you in business, Pay attention to this story because it's about a man who retired early 
from a successful career in the garment industry, and he moved into a new industry because it was so much fun. For nearly four decades, Nick Badami was one of the most influential figures in the skiing industry in the United States. His background of business success, plus his leadership skills and enthusiasm for the sport, extended to nearly every aspect of winter sports. Retired at the age of 49 from his successful management of BBD, Badami plunged headlong into his son Craig's passion for skiing and ski racing. In 1970, seeing an opportunity in the ski world, he purchased Alpine Meadows in California. Five years later, he added Park City Mountain Resort in Utah to the family, building a trend of success for those resorts that continues to this day. His appointment to the board of directors of the National Ski Areas Association in 1978 gave evidence of the rapid respect Nick gained through the ski industry. Just six years later, he was named the board chairman. Badami had officially become the go-to guy for nearly everyone in the resort industry seeking advice and counsel, and his impact continues to be manifest on a daily basis. Eventually, he would sell his resort interest to Powder Corp, but remained its chairman for nine years following the sale. Nick and Craig worked together to make Park City a world-class destination for skiing. They earned immediate international accolades for developing the idea of America's opening in 1986, bringing a sense of festival to World Cup ski racing and an entertainment platform that changed and modernized the white circus globally. Father and son created a party-like atmosphere that made the World Cup fun for athletes and fans alike. While Nick focused on improving the ski resort experience, he also had one eye on what was happening with the athletes who raced on the U.S. ski team. In 1974, he was appointed to the U.S. Ski Educational Foundation as a trustee, building on that relationship through to the 1990s when he became the chairman of U.S. Ski. Through his vigilant guidance and leadership, USSA became a sound organization that could provide young skiers across the country with an opportunity to pursue their Olympic dreams. Many athletes from this era achieved unprecedented success, earning recognition in the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame. Steve and Phil Mayer, Debbie Armstrong, Hillary Lind, Julie Parisian, and Peekaboo Street, to name just a few. The legacy Badami created continues today with the great success of outstanding American skiers like Lindsey Vaughn, Bodie Miller, and Ted Ligety. Naturally, Nick's expertise was called upon for the preparation of the 2002 Olympic Winter Games in Salt Lake. He served as a director on the successful Olympic Bid Committee and continued as a director on the organizing committee. For his outstanding career service to skiing, Badami was awarded the Julius Blegan Award for Outstanding Volunteer Service by USSA in 1992. Nicholas Badami was a leader possessed with unsurpassed vision, business experience, and acumen. Skiing in the United States is truly blessed that he chose to bring his extraordinary ability to its service for over 40 years. Tonight, by inducting him into the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame as an honored member, we will ensure that this extraordinary legacy will be preserved forever in the annals of American ski sports. Nick passed away in June 2008 at the age of 87. But following in his grandpa's footsteps, please welcome grandson Nicholas, a student at the University of Colorado Boulder, to this stage. First, I'd like to thank the people of Ishpeming, Michigan. Or, um, this has been a great experience up here and seeing the Hall of Fame. Um, I would also like to thank the Hall of Fame for their recognition of my grandfather. Um, I'd like to congratulate the other inductees as well. I'm truly honored to accept this award uh, from my late grandfather, Nick Badami. Safe to say that I wouldn't be accepting this award if my father, Craig, hadn't dragged my grandpa out west with visions of getting involved in the ski business. 
To my dad, Lake Tahoe and Park City were like an untouched heaven waiting for them to establish their legacy. The two of them made an incredible team and helped put resorts such as Alpine Meadows and Park City on the map domestically and internationally. They had a vision to bring international ski racing to Park City. And if you knew my dad and grandpa, you knew it was only a matter of time before they took that vision and turned it into a reality. My dad went to Kitzbühel twice in one winter in search of Serge Lang, who was the founder of World Cup ski racing. Some would call it stalking, uh, others would call it sheer brilliance, because on that second trip, my dad figured out what hotel Serge was staying at and waited for him to arrive. It only took a quick 15-minute conversation in the hotel lobby, and boom. Not only did he get the Men's and Women's World Cup to Park City, but he made sure it was the America's opening. My dad and grandpa's unique approach turned these races into events, with fireworks, concerts that started in the morning and lasted into the cold, wintry nights. This would eventually lead to another one of their visions, which was hosting Olympic events at Park City Mountain Resort in 2002. The resort had the, held the men's and women's giant slalom, snowboard giant slalom, and half-pipe events. Watching these events with my grandpa was something I'll never forget. He was glowing with happiness and excitement, especially when the American men swept the podium during the half-pipe event. Grandpa spent over three decades in the ski industry, and for most of that time he was with the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Association, chairman of the board for the National Ski Area Association, and the American Ski Federation. He was trustee and board member of the Salt Lake Olympic Organizing Committee and founder of the National Avalanche Foundation. The list goes on and on. If you ever to ask him about these accomplishments, he would never take all the credit. Instead, he would shift the attention off of him and onto the men and women with whom he worked. My grandpa was a very unselfish man and never wanted to be in the spotlight, but he couldn't avoid it, till I came around. When I got to a certain age, he would place me on stage to hand out the winnings to all the racers after the World Cup events. After doing this for a number of years, it got to a point when I began to know some of the most frequent guests of the podium, including the great Alberto Tamba. He and I became friends, and one day after another victory at Park City, I went to hand him his award, and he picked me up and placed me on his shoulders. I remember thinking to myself, I would have loved to see him put Grandpa on his shoulders. Another way my grandpa liked to share the spotlight was when he was picked to be the torchbearer in the 2002 Olympics. He knew right away that I was going to do the honor and run with the torch on his behalf. He also knew that I would take over his duty of handing out flowers to the winners of the events that took place at Park City Mountain Resort. So it's only right that I stand before you today and accept this award on his behalf. These are all moments in my life that I will never forget because of his altruism. For all of you that knew my grandpa, I'm sure he instilled some lifelong memories in you to enjoy forever as well. When thinking back on my grandpa's legacy and his life, I can't help but think of a famous inspirational quote by President Lincoln. And in the end, it's not the years in your life, but the life in your years. Thank you. Nick Badami. I know his grandpa's proud. Do you have a mission? Do you have something that you hope to be remembered for? If you receive this publication, how many of you get this publication? If you do, you're members of the Hall of Fame. If you receive this publication, it comes out six times a year, we thank you, of course, at the Ski Hall of Fame, but it's because of Mason Beakley. His is not a household name in the world of skiing. I had to, I've heard it so many times, and to hear the story of this man and what he did for our sport. And tonight's an opportunity for you to learn that story as well. And I think, after knowing Mason Beakley, you will appreciate the history of skiing all the more. A successful businessman and passionate skier, the skiing community owes a debt of gratitude to Mason Beakley for his efforts to preserve the history of our great winter sport. As a founder of the International Skiing History Association and the first visionary behind the acclaimed journal Skiing Heritage, Mason left a vital legacy for future generations to not only enjoy but also learn from. Beakley grew up in Connecticut and started skiing as a child. While attending Princeton, he began collecting books on skiing, while also coaching at the school where he taught following his graduation. 
Soon, however, the real world beckoned and he joined his father's firm, which printed medical forms. Through his efforts and imagination, he computerized the company's services and created the markers that are placed on the patient to orient x-ray machines. All the while, family and skiing remained an important part of his life. With his wife, Licia, he introduced the sport to his four girls while continuing to collect ski books. By 1990, his library contained over 1,500 titles. Mason expanded his collection to include all forms of ski art, paintings, posters, sculptures, and magazine illustrations. He counted on Andrew Wyeth watercolors and the famous Charles Adams cartoon of ski tracks around a tree. It was said that he single-handedly created the market for the rare ski poster art, his collection growing to the point that he created his own gallery and library to house it. It was aptly coined the Ski Airy. His passion for skiing did not end there. Beakley also understood the importance of the social nature of the sport and sought to encourage outreach to and among those who enjoyed skiing's past. He began by writing to 100 prominent skiers and sports historians, inviting them to join what he called the International Skiing History Association. In 1992, he organized the first gathering of these members at Whistler, British Columbia. The 1993 gathering took place in Sun Valley, with speakers including America's first Olympic champion from skiing, Gretchen Frazier, Sun Valley's founder, Bill Jantz, and pioneer ski film producer, John Jay. With the International Skiing History Association now firmly established, Beakley wanted a publication to maintain and expand the connection for the association's members. In 1992, the group took over a small magazine formerly called Snow News, and they renamed it Skiing Heritage, with former ski magazine editor and Hall of Famer Mort Lund as its first editor. Over the years, thanks to Mason's financial support, the publication grew to reach thousands of readers six times a year. Mason Beakley passed away in 2001, but his legacy is still very much alive. It is alive not just in the magazine, but in an acclaimed website filled with stories of skiing history, an annual awards program including a lecture named for him and his incredible collections of books and ski art. His International Skiing History Association is now headquartered at our Sports National Museum in Ishpeming, Michigan. In light of his lifelong passion and accomplishment, Mason Beakley richly deserves to be honored and remembered through his induction into the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome two of Mason's four daughters, Sarah Wardell from Stowe, Vermont, and Liza Lee Kramer from Atlanta, Georgia. Hello, everybody. Noah Webster defines passion as the intent interest in a subject that is thoroughly researched, diligently pursued, mastered, preserved, and passed down to the next generation. <clears throat> Mason Meekly had a passion for skiing history as well as the interest in daring to look for answers to questions like where and when did skiing begin? Where are we now? And what will the sport look like in the future? Mason didn't write the history. He was simply a part of it. He learned from the masters who wrote about it, painted the painting, designed the posters and clothing, and crafted the skis. He learned it from some of you assembled here tonight. Mason would like to thank the loyal and dedicated members of the International Skiing History Association especially Mort Lund, Doug Pfeiffer, 
John Fry, Bernie Weasel, Barry Stone, and others who diligently worked on behalf of ISHA. He would also like to thank the nominating committee for the honor of inducting him into the Skiing Hall of Fame. In closing, I know Mason would say, our father, when you see someone on the slopes on a brilliant cold morning, ask him or her, how was the skiing today? And yet the reply is, great, I have a passion for this, or I love this. Look at them and say, act on your passion or love, master it, go to great places, meet interesting people, and encourage them to pass the history down to their children. Mason would have wanted this and this honor of being inducted into the Skiing Hall of Fame. On behalf of our family, the Beakley family, we say, Thank you for sharing history with us. Have a chance to chat with them some more tonight at the Hall of Fame. The placement ceremony will be following our induction here at the Hall of Fame. It's long been my mantra that everything gets better when you get outside. And if you have to go inside, then you go straight to your desk and you write about what you just did so that you can lure other friends to go out there with you again. Well, that was Dick Dorr with his lifelong motivation. He was a racer, a climber, a writer, and you'll find out even more. Life is all about skiing for Dick Dorworth, and as his former coach and friend Bob Beatty has said, Dick owns few possessions because the adventure of the outdoor world presents him everything. His illustrious career has literally come in contact with every aspect of skiing and every corner of the world where opportunities to ski exist. A ski racer and the holder of the world speed skiing record, Dorworth has also enjoyed stints as coach and as mentor, ski instructor, mountain guide, adventurer, journalist, and award-winning author. Growing up in the California Sierras, going fast on skis came naturally to him. He was an All-American racer for the University of Nevada, a winner of Reno's Silver Dollar Derby, and named the first ever U.S. National Development Ski Team. In 1963, he set the course record at Sun Valley's Diamond Sun Race, a record that still stands today. That same year, he traveled to Portillo, Chile, where he set the world speed record on skis of 106 miles per hour. Dorworth then turned his attention to helping others go fast. He coached the U.S. men's ski team for the 1970-71 winter, but quickly returned to his passion of skiing and mountaineering, serving as a guide for the Yosemite Mountain School, along with Shasta and Exum Mountain Guides. From 1988 to 1992, he was the director of the Aspen Mountain Ski School, through all of this, Dick was continuing to evolve, developing a reputation as a top-notch ski journalist and author, transferring his skiing and adventure experiences to the printed page. Each month, readers of Ski Magazine would eagerly await his column, A Skier's Journal. Among his own personal favorites were his report on the Squaw Valley tram accident in March of 1978, the American Friendship Expedition to China in 1981, and his piece of skiing fiction entitled The Perfect Turn which is widely regarded as one of the best examples of ski riding. Now in his 70s and a reporter for the Idaho Mountain Express, Dick Dorworth's life is still focused around the mountains, skiing down them every day in the winter and climbing up them in the summer. There's no doubt that this is a man who dances to his own beat. There are precious few individuals who have been able to assemble so many different talents along with high level of passion for his sport into one body. We now welcome Dick Dorworth into the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame and present him with Ski Sports' highest award, the Medal of Honor. Unfortunately, a family wedding has kept Dick from traveling from his home in Sun Valley, Idaho, to be with us tonight. But don't you know, if we could get him at the Hall of Fame to tell us how in the world he went 106 miles an hour on those skis? I don't, I don't know. The only person I know that can go that fast is Jeannie Thorne, 
and and she maybe she'll get some tips. But um, those I look to me like a pair of woodies, and I don't know. That was pretty crazy. The stories cataloged by the U.S. ski team rank as some of the best in athletic history, but there is so many things that you can look at when you see someone who has spent their lifetime on skis, and we're going to get a chance to meet and hear the stories of Phil Gravink. Philip Gravink has been a guiding light for the ski resort industry for over four decades, running the gamut from founding and owning a ski area to managing some of the best ski resorts in the East. He has served on countless national committees that have had major impact on the development of ski resorts and the improvement of the ski experience in this country, while also being called upon for his expertise internationally. Graving grew up on the family dairy farm in Clymer, New York, and after graduating from high school, attended Cornell University to study agricultural science. While at Cornell, he joined the university's rowing team, helping to lead them to numerous intercollegiate championships as a stroke oarsman. His rowing career was capped by winning a gold medal at the historic Henley Regatta in England, where Cornell shattered the 118-year course record. The crew would also taste victory at the European Championships in Switzerland. Philip returned from college to help manage the family farm, but noting a growing interest in skiing in the area and with the encouragement of Otto Schneibs, he founded the Peak and Peak Ski Area, serving as its general manager and chairman of the board for 13 years. In 1976 and 1977, he took on the general manager's position of the state of New York's Gore Mountain. His success in the industry caught the eye of Sherman Adams, who recruited him as the CEO of Loon Mountain in New Hampshire. Under his direction from 1977 to 91, Loon flourished, becoming a thoroughly modern and top-ranked ski area. He would parlay this success into a role as Senior Associate of Snow Engineering, with his consulting work at Atatash leading to his being named the resort CEO until 1999. To say that Phil loved to build ski areas is no exaggeration. During the course of his career, he oversaw the building of six base lodges, 26 lifts and three hotels, along with several trail systems. As if this was not enough, Grave Inc. served on many National Ski Area Association committees, along with its board of directors, including a two-year stint as board chairman. A director for 17 years, he provided his expertise on insurance, ski safety, weather modification, and operations manual committees, as well as working with the U.S. Forest Service on regulations and policies. Among his numerous achievements were his years as a delegate to the American Society for Testing and Materials. It was during his tenure that many safety innovations were developed, including the ski safety brake his work considerably enhancing the skiing experience for millions across the country. Phil's leadership also paid benefits at the state and regional level as well, including seven years as the president and treasurer of the ski areas of New York. In addition, he provided countless hours to many community organizations outside of skiing. As a result of his outstanding lifetime contributions, Grave Inc. has received countless accolades and awards, including the NSAA's Sherman Adams Award, its Lifetime Achievement Award, and the BEWI Service to the Ski Industry Award. We are honored to now present Philip Grave Inc. with the Medal of Honor and welcome him as an honored member of the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome from Jackson, New Hampshire, this renaissance man of skiing, Phil Graving. Thanks, Tom and Frida, and thank you folks for coming out to enjoy the evening with us. 
In the 11 or so months since uh, the class of 11 was announced, there have been more numerous happy reunions, more nice letters from people who I'd forgotten that I knew well many years ago, great emails, and many, many lifetime memories. I've always said, and Shirley and I have always said, any day that you can earn a lifetime memory, as long as it's a good memory, is something that is, should be dearly treasured. And this association with the National Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame has provided many of those. I want to thank Tom, his staff, and the volunteers that have put this weekend together. I want to thank the people, Bernie Weichel, and along with Tom and their staffs that put the great week in the Pacific Northwest together. It's been a wonderful year with many lifetime memories. My career started, as the movie told a little about, in upstate western New York, in fact, the westernmost township in the state of New York, near Erie, Pennsylvania, in the heart of the Lake Erie snow belt. We considered ourselves more Midwesterners than Easterners, and we certainly related better as I went on through the various offices of National Series Association and American Ski Federation that I always had a better kinship or a more immediate kinship with the people of the Midwest and the people of the Mid-Atlantic than I did with our brethren from both the higher mountains of the East and the West, although I soon learned that they were wonderful people too. We considered ourselves the incubator areas of the sport of alpine skiing. And even yet today, those resorts with less than seven or 800 vertical feet provide for more of the starting of families and individuals into our sport than do some of the higher mountains. We love to start those families, make our areas their home, and then pass them off to the great vacation in the great mountains of our west and our east, of our east. The Upper Peninsula is certainly a part of that legacy of the incubators, both in Alpine and certainly the outstanding part of our American heritage in Nordic and jumping. To carry that one farther, the ability of you people here in Ishpeming to start and build a Ski Hall of Fame way back then, and for you folks to carry it on, is indeed in the right place. Some people have said it should be in California, it should be in Denver, it should be in Boston. No, it's in the right place amongst us incubators of the sport of skiing, and we thank you. <laughs> when, we, when I found help to found Peak and Peak in 1964, we hired Otto Schneebs, also an honor member of this Hall of Fame. He came over from Germany in 1927, became the Dartmouth uh, head coach for many years, and later St. Lawrence, then went on to become the ski school manager and the, and the shop manager at Whiteface Mountain. And in that period of time, he also did some uh, consulting for those of us who were starting. Fortunately, we learned about Otto Schneebs in 1963, and we enjoyed, and we brought him to Climber, Western New York, to help me lay out the first trails and lift lines for the new resort. He stayed with Shirley and I in our farmhouse, and on the last of several nights that winter as we slogged through the snows, which were a good year then, it was 200 and some inches of snow on the ground, he said to me that last, to us that last evening, he said, Phil, skiing is more than a sport. Skiing is more than a way of life. Excuse me, I, I messed up the, the punchline. Skiing is more than a business. Skiing is a way of life. It probably took me a few years to appreciate that. But nothing has become more obvious, not only to me, but the other inductees here in the room, which I congratulate, that skiing indeed is a way of life. Thank you.
It is truly not only a way of life, but it gives us life. Harry Leonard lights up a room. He's got a smile as bright as a spotlight. And I think that comes because he truly loves skiing. Really, really loves skiing. And do you know where he fell in love with the sport? Found this out. I love it. In 1956 at Pine Mountain in Iron Mountain. That may be where the affair started, but he carried that passion all over the country, preaching his love for the sport to thousands. And I don't know if anybody here, Jack, I don't know, did you ever go to the Detroit Ski Show at the Light Guard Armory on 8 Mile Road? I had white go-go boots. I got to go. It's where Freddie Wara got all of his ideas for Christmas. And I thank Harry because he kept us fueled on little Mount Brighton and Pine Knob and Mount Holly and all those little hills there. And they fostered that love of skiing. And every year you go to get that fix because somebody dreamed up ways to promote our sport, Harry Leonard. Every sport needs its own version of P.T. Barnum, a showman, that special person who can bring the sport to life for the average Joe who might otherwise never be touched by the magic. For the sport of skiing, that person was Harry Leonard, the founder of the annual Fall Skiing Show, which brings the products, fun, and excitement together around the country, with thousands of skiers chomping at the bit for the first hint of snow. Harry's career began in a much different world, trying to drum up excitement of another product as a printer's representative and in the sale of newspaper advertising. An epiphany in 1956 would change all that, not to mention Leonard's life. He fell in love with skiing. It happened while on a weekend trip in Michigan's Upper Peninsula at the Pine Mountain Resort. Ever the optimist, he noticed that there were no guides to other ski areas around the country and so he set out to publish one. His first Midwest directory was known as Ski Ferry. The publication would open doors for Harry, including an invitation to organize the annual preseason party of the Chicago Ski Club. Rather than just hosting a party, Leonard turned it into a consumer show that ended up attracting some 2,000 people. His career as a ski show impresario was underway. He organized a similar show in Detroit the following year, followed by New York City in 1960. By the mid-60s, his shows were coast to coast. Harry understood that dedicated skiers were desperate to get back to the slopes after the summer, and with that desperation came an eagerness to see all the new equipment and gear for the coming season. But just providing a preview was not enough. He also understood that these die-hard skiers wanted to be entertained as well, and he implemented many ideas that drew thousands to his show. Among these ideas was the ski deck, invented in 1961. Harry was one of the first to use it at his shows, and he brought skiing's racing stars to freestylers to perform, providing the wow factor. Skiing stars like Stein Erickson, Billy Kidd, Penny Pateau, Jean-Claude Keeley, and Wade Wong not only appeared, but performed at his shows, providing an essential ingredient to enhancing the public interest. Jerry Simon joined forces with Harry in 1964, becoming his ringmaster and chief promoter, as well as lifelong sidekick. Leonard's shows, operating under the name Halco Productions, were fun and entertaining, but they also became the place to meet and make friends with a fascinating array of marvelous people involved in the sport. The show proved to be an important factor in the growth of skiing throughout the 1960s and 70s. Although he retired from the ski show business in 1980 and moved on to other interests, Harry Leonard remains a highly regarded and unforgettable industry trendsetter, leaving an indelible mark and legacy which continues to this day. He is a charter communication member of SIA and organized the first trade show for the National Ski Areas Association. The recipient of many awards, Harry Leonard richly deserves his place in the U.S. Ski and Snowbird Hall of Fame as we now present him with the Medal of Honor. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome from Cream Ridge, New Jersey, Harry Leonard.
goodness. Uh, <laughs> I do wish I had the time to tell you some of the many stories that uh, go into uh, producing a ski show uh, from city to city. All the cities varied, all the attendees varied, and all the participants varied, but there was one thing about the whole thing that I think is the big reason you are all sitting out there right now, and that is that we all had fun. Doing those shows was nothing but fun. They didn't make a lot of money, and we had lots of weather problems and strikes and newspaper collapses and all kinds of things, fires, a big fire at the Chicago uh, McCormick place. But the point was through the entire thing, and it lasted 20 some years, uh, the one ingredient that uh, pervaded everything we did was that, my God, we were having the most fun. And in a way, it's a little embarrassing for me to be up here and to accept this, this honor of honors, along with my confreres who have been honored tonight, and for which I do. I may not sound thankful, but by golly, it's the greatest thing that has ever happened to me. But. Uh, I just, I just wish I could tell you some of, some of our, our great ski show stories. But it's an honor, and it's, it's a wonderful thing to be here right with Pine Mountain, right next door where I started. And uh, it's just totally great, and I do thank you all. I'm going home to New Jersey on Sunday, and I promise you one thing. I am going to think about all of you and what a neat neighborhood this is and how how much of America you have up here, which a whole bunch of us around the country know not enough about. But it's a welcoming, warm-hearted, good-looking, uh, flourishing neighborhood. And I think you're all lucky, and I will miss you when I go home, especially Frida and Tom. <laughs> I'm so glad that skiing's got Harry Leonard. Who watched the Summer Olympics in London? Did you watch them? Were you inspired? Oh, man, I thought I could run again. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's wonderful to just be in that mood, feel that excitement. But I have to admit, I mean, I appreciate the Summer Games, but the Winter Games, they just top it all. Because it's not just... Man against man, man against the mountain. It's man against the weather. It's everything it takes to arrive at that competition. It's the wind, it's the cold, it's the ice, it's the snow. And when you have made the US ski or snowboard team, you know that you've seen all those trials on the way up there. And then there it is. That exceptional breed of athlete will take all those forces and then defy gravity too, like Joe Pack. One of the most exciting and pressure packed moments of the 2002 Olympic Winter Games in Salt Lake transpired during the finals of the men's aerials competition in freestyle skiing. U.S. ski team member and Park City local Joe Pack, competing in front of a huge hometown crowd, stood poised for his final run. Any hope of an Olympic medal rested on his ability to be perfect. The rest, as they say, is history. The Olympic silver was his. Although born in Oregon, Pack spent much of his youth on the opposite side of the country in New Hampshire. The product of athletic parents, he enjoyed a wide range of sports, especially soccer, baseball, and yes, ski jumping. Jumping is a high school sport in the Northeast, and by the time he was eight, Joe was following in his brother Jeremy's tracks onto the jumps. He would even compete in the Junior Nationals in Alaska. The Olympic Training Center in Lake Placid not only became an important part of his training regimen, but also led to an early appreciation for Olympic sports. By the time he was 12, Pack had ridden the 90-meter ski jump in Placid, and to this day, he credits his experiences in the former Olympic town for helping to shape him into a world-class athlete. While ski jumping would not eventually define his future, jumping of a different sort was an integral part of his career. The hot, muggy summers in the east made the prospect of landing in a pool as a part of freestyle aerials training sound so much more appealing. 
Given his well-rounded sports background, confidence in his ability and body awareness from having to compete against older athletes, Joe soon developed into one of the country's leading aerialists. In 1996, at the age of 17, he won the World Junior Aerials Championship. Forced to the sidelines by a knee injury in the 1998 Olympic season, PAC and Olympic champion and Hall of Fame teammate Eric Bogost would provide a solid one-two punch for the American team in international competition in the years that followed. He captured a bronze medal in the 1999 World Championships and was third overall in World Cup aerials the following winter. The 2001 Worlds resulted in a repeat of his bronze medal performance and he finished the World Cup season ranked second in aerials and third overall. All of this would lead to his silver moment in Salt Lake. Retiring from active competition in 2006, Pack left the sport with 16 World Cup podiums, three World Cup wins, and two World Championship medals. Today, Joe Pack, one of the most popular freestyle athletes of his day, climbs to the top of the podium once again as a recipient of the Medal of Honor and honored membership in the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome all the way from Hawaii, Olympic silver medalist and world champion Joe Pack. Thank you very much. Frida, you're a fantastic MC, by the way. I'm really enjoying it. It's great to be here. Um, I just have been with, with open arms. Everybody's been so hospitable. It's my first time to the UP. I would love to come ski Pine Mountain one day. But uh, just to take a couple from what you guys said earlier, I know you saw a couple of those shots, and me and my buddies had barley sodas in our hands, and a couple of them. That was always after the event, not before the event. But we did have fun, and we did. it was a lifestyle. And to listen to some of these presentations, I just feel so blessed that I was given the opportunity by so many people to actually pursue what I wanted to do. And I was one of those lucky few people that, at a very young age, I knew what inspired me and what I wanted to do, and that was to ski. It wasn't always just to ski. I loved alpine ski, but I loved ski jumping. I loved freestyle. I quit skiing for two years and just snowboarded. And these days, there's so many parks and half pipes around to play around, and you can just, there's so many things to do outside on the ski mountains. And because of Nick Badami, and because of the ski shows, because of USSA, because of the United States ski team, I was given the opportunity to be able to do that. And for, for just from the bottom of my heart, I want to say thank you to everybody. From the beginning, um, I, I love the giving opportunities to others is because the other people that I really have to thank are my family. Uh, my father and my mother, we moved from New Hampshire. Uh, my, my grandparents were on the West Coast in Oregon. And they moved us from New Hampshire and they decided to stop in Park City because that was the home of the U.S. ski team. That was for me. I got a chance to pursue my Olympic dream. I, uh, it was a kind of a, a long road. I, uh, I did my ACL about two months before the 1998 games and trained very, very hard for the 2002 games and ended up on the podium, which was just the highlight of my life. Um, as I think back in those days, and I'm, I'm retired now, and I have a, have a family, and I live, I live in the summer, I live in Hawaii, but I go on vacations and ski with my family back in Park City. It's just these memories are just coming, they're just flooding back with all of the, the great people that you meet. You know, from skiing in Upper Peninsula to skiing, I've skied in, in, uh, outside of Cleveland, Ohio with a couple friends, to skiing the Alps, to skiing the East, to skiing the West. Everybody shares that same passion. And I love skiing. I'm so happy to be part of it. And I'm so honored to be part of the US Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you, guys.
You know, on the subject of Olympics, I don't know if you all remember, Muffy Davis was here last year, and she was in the Paralympics in London and won three. Three gold. Yep, three in hand cycling. Yep. Three gold medals in hand cycling. So hats off to Muffy. I'll spin you back a little bit. Anybody remember watching the Sapporo Olympics? Oh, that was so, that was my era. Ooh, that was great. And that amazing racer from New Hampshire, Tyler Palmer. As long as Tyler Palmer can remember, his entire life has been dedicated to ski racing. A major force during the 1970s, Tyler helped to bring attention to the competitive side of the sport during a pivotal time for skiing as racing at the World Cup level was beginning to mature and attract large audiences of fans. Tyler and his younger brother Terry were introduced to skiing at a very early age. Raised initially in rural Massachusetts and later in North Conway, New Hampshire, they became all-around skiers, participating in the Ski Meister program at Holderness Prep School. Together, they were extremely hard to beat. If Tyler wasn't on top of the podium, it was because his brother Terry was. In 1968, at the age of 17, Tyler competed in his first season of World Cup racing, recording solid and impressive results. The following year, he won the U.S. Junior Nationals and was named to the U.S. Ski Team in 1970. From the outset, Tyler proved he was a top competitor. In 1971, he finished third in the World Cup slalom standings and was 10th in the overall rankings. He was named to the U.S. Olympic team and finished 9th at the Sapporo Games in 1972. During his career on the U.S. ski team, he enjoyed two World Cup victories, four World Cup podiums, and was in the top 10 nine times. Palmer retired from the U.S. ski team in 1976 to join Bob Biatti's World Professional Tour, teaming up with Jean-Claude Keeley on the Rossignol Pro Team. He ended the season ranked as the top American on the tour, winning five races in the process. He was one of the few racers who could give the legendary Keeley a run for his money. Palmer credits much of his success to the many friendships he cultivated on the Pro Tour, especially Jimmy Huga and Spider Savage. These legends of their day taught him how to remain focused on race days and to strengthen his mind and attitude to create a winning mode. He also credits Biatti with being a major contributor to the success that he enjoyed on the Tour. Following his retirement from racing, Tyler remained involved in the sport, teaching youngsters and students about ski racing. He returned to the East, coaching at Holderness for several years before heading west again to Ketchum, Idaho. Despite learning to live with diabetes, Palmer pushed himself to support the young skiers under his wing. He often sacrificed his body to ensure that every child benefited from his time, squeezing everything out of himself in the name of skiing and coaching his racers. His skiers came to respect their sport, understanding its history and how it could make them better people. Eventually, his declining health would force him to retire and return to the family home in New Hampshire, where he continues to enjoy skiing and hunting, as well as the company of his many friends. We now welcome Tyler Palmer into the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame and present him with skiing's highest award, the Medal of Honor. The focused racer, the passionate coach. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome from Kearsarge, New Hampshire, Tyler Palmer. I'd like to thank the Hall of Fame and Tom West um, and all his group and Frida. Boy, what a public speaker. I don't think you'll expect the same out of me, I hope. <laughs> but, so it flows from her. Um, Ann Schroeder at the Hall and everybody has 
really made a huge impact on my life by inviting me into this wonderful and honored group. Um, for me, uh, skiing has been a huge part of my life uh, from the time I started, and I really, um, I can't say, you know, the memories that I have, I mean, being inducted with these people here, um, it just awes me. I'm, these people are all, they would have been Hall of Fame and a lot of other things besides, and they've all done other things besides skiing. Uh, the only thing that I've really devoted myself to is skiing and ski racing and the sport of skiing. And the biggest part of that was my family. And I feel I grew up in a town just like this, 700 foot vertical, um, a tight community. Uh, we go into theaters like this and watch the ski movies and stuff in the fall and October getting ready and I'd be so amped. Um, you know, sometimes we get snow, sometimes we wouldn't, but uh, it was, the family is what I've always, I'll always remember about skiing and what it's meant to me is the people that I've met along the way have been so gracious and have taught me so much that without them, uh, I'd never be here. Um, and I'm so honored to be part of this family that uh, it's, it's uh, the greatest thing that's ever happened to me and I really appreciate it and thank you all very much. Got to get some tips. You know, you gotta love a girl whose nickname is Bulldog, especially when she can out ski, out lift, out surf, out just about anybody and anything. Eva T from the get go was shaped to be a world class athlete. And to this day, she's still using her talents to teach and preach and inspire people to an active lifestyle. But aren't we glad she was a ski racer? Eva Twardokens, two-time Olympian, six-time U.S. national champion, and world championship bronze medalist. An all-round athlete, you could count on the fact that Twardokens would be at or near the top in World Cup, World Championships, and Olympic competition during her 10 years as a member of the U.S. ski team. Eva's father, George, was a member of the Polish fencing team and competed at the 1952 Olympics in Helsinki, Finland. Six years later, he would take full advantage of the fact that the fencing world championships were being held in Philadelphia, defecting to the United States. His wife, Helena, was allowed to join him four years later, and together they settled in Reno, Nevada. Eva was born in 1965. George and Helena were both skiers, and Helena became a ski instructor at Squaw Valley, while George was named coach of the University of New Mexico ski team. Small wonder that Eva was introduced to skiing before she was two, and by the age of four, she impressed some of the country's leading figures in the sport, demonstrating her techniques at the North American Ski Instructors Congress in Vail, Colorado. Just 17, Tordokens made her World Cup debut in 1982 with an impressive 13th place finish in the combined at Piancavallo, Italy. That same year, Ski Racing Magazine named her their Junior Racer of the Year, repeating the honor the following winter. Two years later, in January of 1985, she finished second in a World Cup Super G event in Switzerland, and shortly thereafter, Eva rocketed to a World Championships bronze medal in the giant slalom in Bormio, Italy, while teammate Diane Roth claimed the gold. That season, she would prove to be the most consistent racer on the American women's team. A knee injury kept Twardokens out of the 1988 Olympic Games, but she was back at full strength in 1992 for the Albertville Olympics, with her eighth place finish in giant slalom marking the best finish for the Americans in those games. Two years later, in Lillehammer, disappointed by her 12th place first run result in giant slalom, Eva stormed back in the second run to leapfrog half of those in front of her to finish sixth. In all, she enjoyed three top 10 finishes at two Olympic Games. Twardokens retired from competitive racing in 1995, but could not distance herself from the sport, winning the World Championships for technical skiing in 1996. Always an all-around athlete, she took up weightlifting and recorded a Masters National Championship title. 
strong fitness advocate to this day. Eva encourages others to remain physically active in their day-to-day -day lives the same way she attacked a World Cup course. The U.S. Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame is proud to welcome Eva Twardokens as an honored member and award her the Medal of Honor, the sport's highest award. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome two-time Olympian and world champion, Eva Twardokens. compliments about being an athlete, but with all my fellow inductees, we've all had a conversation about how hard it is for me to walk in heels, so <laughs> that was the biggest part of the night right there. Um, I want to um, thank everyone for having me here. I want to thank the people who nominated me. I think that's really one of the things that I am proud of is that the public um, nominated all of us, and I think that's great. Um, and I want to thank the board for inducting me, and I also want to um, congratulate my fellow inductees. I'm really proud to be um, amongst them, and uh, I'm in awe of them, and it's, it's great to be a part of this family. Um, this injection has been really great for me because when I stopped skiing, I moved into warmer climate and um, started doing all kinds of other sports, and, um, you know, I ended up with a little bit of a new community, um, people who really didn't ski that much. And um, over the years, I started to forget about my career as a ski racer, and it lost a little bit of importance in my life. And having being inducted into the Ski Hall of Fame has been great. I've told so many people, you know, I live in a warm climate, but being inducted into the Ski Hall of Fame is like um, winning a ski race you know, without training. <laughs> it's, so it's been, it's been wonderful. It has um, been great to look back on all the hard work and the memories and uh, the coaches and my teammates and the stories and the glory. You know, I have a lot of stories. Um, and if you come up to me, I'll tell you why, why I was named Bulldog. There were several reasons. Um, and then I just, I think that this is a, a great thing to have every year. Um, because it brings into conversation skiing. Um, and I think that this induction happens at a really great time. You know, Warren Miller has his film come out and gets everyone excited for ski race or for skiing. And, um, and I think this is a really good warm up for the ski season as well, is to, you know, have this induction here in Ishpeming. And this is my first time in this part of the country, and I, I really appreciate that you have me here. Um, and I just want to thank all the people who supported me through my ski racing career. You know, everyone here has talked about their family, and that was huge for me um, and, um, and my friends. But also I want to thank the people who didn't know much about my skiing career and how they really came out of the woodwork and supported me in this time of my life, which, like many of us have said, is, has been one of the best times of my life, being inducted to the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame. So um, I want to thank not only the people that were involved in my ski career, but the people who were involved in the in-between time and who have kind of come out of the woodwork and just been so supportive through this time. And it's given them an opportunity to see what my history was about in skiing. And um, so I want to just thank everyone here, and I want to thank all the inductees. It's been great to spend time with you, and it's been a, a wonderful year for me, and um, you know, this is a time in my life that I'll never forget, and um, I want to thank everyone. And thank you, Tom, for uh, putting, putting all this together and being so wonderful. Don't go away. So we need 
Tyler and Joe and Harry and Shirley come with Phil and Nicholas. Come on back up and we need our ski jumpers because we must conclude this evening. There's Liza Lee and Sarah. We must conclude this evening the way we do every induction ceremony. We've got to be singing our ski jumper song. So Don Hurst, you know that song? Come on up. And I think Rudy's here. Dave knows it. Come on, we need some singers. Knut, yes, we need those singers. Come on up, folks. Jim Manti, we need you to come sing this song with us. And if you don't know the words, are they in the, are they in the program? They're on a screen. Are they also on the program? Do we have them? They're not in the program, so we need some singers. Come on up, guys. Rudy, no more esto. Dave, come on. Don, come on. You know the song. Come on, we need some singers. How about these five guys in front right here? Yeah, these youngsters. Matt, do you know this song? You don't know the song. You know, you should come learn this song. That's Matthew Anderson, and he is. He knows how to use an iPhone, right? He knows how to use an iPhone. You bet he does. Can he yep. take pictures for us? Can he take pictures? I think he sure can. And sing at the same time? And sing. Come on, Jim and Knut. We just had a ski jumpers reunion today. Did you guys have too much to eat at the camp? Get in there, Dave. I'm done. Yeah, John. Ponty, get in. Yep, yep. Get in there. So we have to tell our new inductees, just you kind of, you'll get the hang of this song. It's really good. And who's going to take the mic and get us started singing? Who's the big one? Who can start us singing? Where do we got it? They're form. Oh, the big and small, the small and big. They jump until they're blue. And when they all get through, the president pulls a string, and they drop their skis and sing. Yah, 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 it is so loud. Hallelujah, this is the last. Hallelujah, this is the last. Yah, 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 it is so loud. Hallelujah, this is the last. Stop, president, and go to school. Matthew Anderson, you've got to learn that song because somebody's got to carry this forward. And we can just make it work for doing, I, what's your latest trick? Switchback 900, something like that? <laughs> all righty. Thank you all for coming.